Uh, welcome to the uh, monthly meeting of the West Sacramento Area Flood Control Agency. Uh, first order of business, would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, first uh, item is agenda approval. Is there any changes to the agenda, or should we, uh, or I'll accept a uh, motion to approve it as is? I'll make a motion we approve the agenda. I'll second that. And moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, Item two, there is no closed session today, so there's nothing to report. Item three, public comment on matters not on the agenda. Uh, we have no uh, speaker cards at this point, and seeing no, no one uh, here to make any uh, comments, we'll move forward to uh, item four, which is approval of the August 23rd meeting, meeting minutes. I'll make a motion that uh, we accept the and I'll second that. It's been uh, moved and seconded that we approve the uh, August 23rd, 2017 minutes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Review of monthly and year-to-date revenue and expenses. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the board. This report summarizes revenue and expenses for the month of July 2017, the first month of fiscal year 2017-18. The agency's starting position for the month in funds 870 and 871 was approximately $9.6 million. No appreciable revenues were received. On the expenditure side, there were 23, approximately $24,000 in O&M expenses. And the month on the project side finished with a negative number because we had two large reverse accruals for work that on invoices that was done in June. So we took that portion of the work and estimated that, that cost and moved it back into the pre previous fiscal year. So it shows up as a negative for the month. Um, most of the actual activity was staff time, um, some minor invoices from travel monitors, and uh, a deposit to the Yolo County Land Bank or Land Trust or something like that for mitigation. Um, in fund, they uh, finished the month then with approximately $10 million uh, on hand in funds 870, 871. That together with the uh, fund, state funding parked in the um, advanced funding account brings the agency's um, on hand cash to $36.2 million. Um, through September 14th, the balance changes and diminishes to $32.8 million, which reflects the um, increased construction activity on the Southport project. Um, the last thing, I included the table for the O&M distributions for the year to show you how that stacked up. And um, it may adjust a little bit. We still haven't written off uh, any of the uh, uh, zero land values that haven't paid. We're still trying to get a few more bucks. But if we don't, we'll have to write that off. And that uh, summarizes the report for July. Thank you. Is there any comments? Yeah. Um, on Measure B, do you uh, reflect in here uh, the amount of money that we receive on Measure B? I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. Let me, oh. let me get tuned in to you here. You got it. You're, you're, you're good. You're good. On uh, Measure B, do, you, do we show a, uh, a line item or something showing how much money we receive on Measure B? We did in the previous fiscal year because that's when we received the first portion of Measure V. Um, I think we're supposed to get it sometime this year or next year or something when the streetcar project moves forward or the second allocation for the flood program. When it shows up, it'll show up as a distinct line item on the revenue side. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, no, there's nothing there. And um, I guess that would do it, yeah. Mark, I just have a couple of the... Um, uh, Charging back on the Southport EIP that 439,000 to the uh -huh. previous fiscal year. I mean, obviously that changes the uh, 
the financials that we saw the month before of the whole year, can, uh, can we get a, uh, in the future, once all of those, you know, um, changes are made, a, a final of the fiscal year 2016, 2017? Yes. And, and, you know, we've, when we had our discussions on the budget with uh, city finance last year, we, uh, earlier this year in June, uh, they said that they would uh, report back to us probably at the end of this, this quarter, which would, you know, October would be a good time mm -hmm. to uh, show us where those uh, uh, ledger adjustments, I guess, was the term they used, were, were made and how it all works out. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, um, we look, look forward to seeing that. The county is going together really nicely this year in finance. It's, it's, it's really tight. Um, so I think we're not going to have any problems, but let's wait till the, the books close. Absolutely. So we don't, we don't change, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, you do a good job. <laughs> Next item is a presentation, and it's an update on the draft of Southport Setback Levy Recreation Trail Report. There you go, that's on, okay. I'm Tracy Michael with the Parks and Rec Department and, and I'm pleased to be presenting to you today an update on the draft Southport Setback Levy Recreation Trail Project. I put together a brief presentation that uh, just simply walks through a little bit of the background to provide some context for the effort, uh, discussion about our coordination efforts, the report findings and major trail recommendations, as well as a brief discussion about next steps. So for background, um, this effort really started in late 2015 as the City Council was preparing their strategic planning efforts for 2016. A Trails Initiative and Parks Master Plan update uh, was a primary action item that resulted from the strategic planning effort. And from that, uh, we also needed to update our bike pit and Trails Master Plan update. Um, we recognized an opportunity to integrate trail planning with a variety of other separate planning efforts that were underway at the time and there was a strong interest in taking the trails initiative piece and, um, and bringing a regional focus to it primarily to make sure we were integrating with these other efforts but also because it presented an opportunity for some non-traditional funding. When we looked at the city of West Sacramento and its location related to uh, riverfront bluffs, miles of levee work that had either been recently completed or was soon to be underway, our existing trail infrastructure on both sides of the river, as well as a lot of agricultural and wildlife, um, biological opinion implementation efforts, uh, we just saw that West Sacramento was uniquely positioned to lead a more regional focused effort. So with that, in 2016, we issued an RFP for the Regional Trails Initiative. Um, in January of 17, City Council approved a contract with HDR, who served as the primary consultant for this report, as well as the Regional Trails Initiative effort. And we used the information that was generated as part of that RFP process to apply for a Caltrans Sustainable Communities Grant for the planning effort. We included in the HDR contract an update to our bike ped trail master plan update so that would accomplish the the local component of the regional trails piece and although we weren't successful in receiving the, the uh, grant that we were hoping for from Caltrans we did receive some funding through DWR as part of the regional flood management project delivery team to focus on exploring the feasibility of adding recreation components to flood projects, recognizing that there is a real interest in creating a multi-benefit project as it relates to flood planning. So in April, uh, which wasn't that long ago, the City Council approved the scope of work for the report and we have been working very hard over the last several months to get the report completed, primarily because um, we wanted it to be used as a foundation for the Parks Master Plan update that's underway, to be fed into the Bike Ped Trail Master Plan update that's also underway, and there were some upcoming grant opportunities and we wanted to make sure we had the information and time to apply for those. Coordination efforts, because so much coordination had already been done as part of the Southport Setback Levy Project, we focused our, our efforts for this report on working with city and West Safeca staff as well as RD900 representatives. 
We looked at the feasibility of implementing the levy trail. We had multiple meetings where we, we really tried to focus on um, planned improvements and how we could integrate those planned improvements into a levy trail system. And, um, and we, we made adjustments based on feedback received. The report findings generally are that it is possible to implement a trail project that is part of the Southport, Sevi, Southport Setback Levy Project um, in its currently built configuration to ensure the levee trail does not increase flood risk, which was really the, the primary focus of this effort in evaluating trails. There are no recommendations to construct any improvements on the water side of the levee. It was also verified that adding the, a class one bike path to the crown of the levee would not affect levee performance and also adding any uh, additional access points to a levee trail would, on the land side would not um, impact levy performance. We also found that the aggregate base that is already part of the construction project to provide O&M access um, sets a really good foundation for a class one bike path and reduces construction costs for the trail significantly. So you get a lot of bang for the buck when you're looking at adding a, a trail component to the top of the levy. So just to walk through the, the basic trail recommendations that are in the report, um, on this graphic here, what we show is that um, using the top of the, the levee in conjunction with already existing or planned trails taking place in the Southport community, we have uh, proposed a 10 mile loop that really connects the Clarksburg Branch Line Trail um, to the Southport setback levee, uh, trail on top of that levee. And then also uh, noted in orange are um, these smaller internal trail loops that take advantage of also um, either existing or planned uh, bike paths on Lake Washington Boulevard, on Davis Road. And then also what's identified are multiple trailhead access points. And so we looked at what's happening with all of Katie Yancey's work and the Pioneer Bluffs and Stonelock Reuse area and where there might be an opportunity to fit in an access point there. We've been looking at a remnant parcel left over from the Southport setback levy project as a potential access, as well as areas that could be incorporated into both the Liberty and River Park developments. And the access points are really important um, they could include features like parking and lighting and signage, but we wanted to make sure there were defined access points, specifically as it relates to seasonal inundation and O&M, because we needed an opportunity to provide users of the trail when certain segments of the trail might be closed and how that affects um, you know, circulation through that trail network. This image just provides a zoomed in look at how a trailhead concept could work. The property here that we're focusing on is um, the remnant parcel at the end of Linden Road adjacent to the levee. If we were to convert that to a trailhead and trail access area, this graphic highlights the different ownership responsibilities for the levee, assuming that the, the state would um, eventually have ownership of the levy itself. The O&M access roads are highlighted in blue and where we might have a recreation easement um, overlaid onto the O&M corridors as well as this particular graphic shows how we could construct an ADA accessible ramp. So the trailhead access area is also focused on where we have existing access roads to the trail and to take advantage of those, but those access roads are not ADA compliant. So if we wanted to add some ADA compliant access points, we could do that without compromising the integrity of the levy. And this is an example of how we might do that at this particular location. Our next steps are to, um, well, first I'd like to mention I took this to council last night for, for um, their um, acceptance and confirmation of all the recommendations that came in the report. We also received approval to move forward and apply for grant funding. So we are pursuing property acquisition of the remnant parcel at Linden Road and uh, the, the new levy project. 
and we are pursuing grant funding through the State Parks Habitat Conservation Fund grant program, which does provide funding for trails for either acquisition or construction of trails that help to connect urban residents with nature. So we believe that this uh, land acquisition and even the levee trail construction could qualify in future years for this grant program. We will take this information and incorporate it into our existing planning update documents for the bike ped trail master plan as well as the parks and open space master plan update and then continue to work with this board and staff on um, pursuing recreation easements which ultimately will be necessary to construct trail improvements. So the report was included as an attachment to the agenda report and that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you very much. Well presented. Any questions? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> I got to hear it twice. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. um, so in terms of the flood control uh, kind of perspective of the project, it seems to me that having eyes on the, on the, on the levee is actually helpful and beneficial to the kind of health of the levee. At the same time, when people have access to something, sometimes they want to get closer to the action and maybe want to go see the river Close up close, and I know that that's kind of been a concern is the degradation on, on the going down to the water side. So, has that been contemplated? I'm sure with the discussions, I'm sure there must have been a lot of discussion about that. But that seems to me, I, I think this is, I think it's a wonderful project, and I'm glad <clears throat> I'm glad we have a chance to to see it here. But that would be my kind of my question. We, we did talk a lot about access areas, and we know there are some areas where people. Um, I don't know that we necessarily want to discourage them from going in some areas when, um, when those areas are accessible. We certainly wouldn't propose constructing any improvements to, um, yeah, they'd be like footpaths that people could use in certain areas. I think we'd be relying a lot on, um, on education and wayfinding in terms of identifying areas where it might be appropriate for that to happen, but we do need to continue to have a larger O&M discussion about how we really do monitor and maintain those areas because while it's helpful to have more, more users on the levee, more eyes on the levee, um, and it does also provide some improved access when you do need to enforce issues, um, there is a real concern about how we do manage the presence of more users out there and not just in our community but when we were pursuing the regional trails initiative we were trying to use that to help launch a more regional discussion about trail o m because it's an issue everywhere and um, you know that that just didn't progress the way that we'd hope but i think that's kind of what needs to happen in the next steps as we begin to explore the recreation easements and what that really means in terms of maintenance and monitoring Anything else? Bill? Nope. Well, um, I have, I have a, just a few questions, and she kind of covered it. This, this what you're showing now is basically uh, a trail on the top of the levee, right? And it's focused on that, mm -hmm. access to it, and, and those type of things. And, and by a, uh, your discussion on the um, base rock uh, road, I assume the final improvement would be a, a paved uh, pathway on the top yes and that would be coordinated with uh, um, RD 900 and and others that it's you know it, it could it could obviously serve a multi-purpose use you know for uh, monitoring flood situations and whatnot so that's there's your multi-benefit right there and the second thing is just what she brought up I mean people are going to want to when they're there they're gonna want to access the river Mm -hmm. to fish or to do who knows what and and uh, I know there'll be further discussions as far as how how that takes place so looking looking forward to that so and then the uh, remnant piece that you're you're talking about at the end of Linden Road that would be acquired by the city is that the yes is that the plan okay very good um, I'm fine no more questions thank you very much thank you we appreciate you coming coming to us thank you <clears throat> um, Consent agenda, which we have one item on there. Um, agent to approve a contract amendment with the Board of Senior Consultants, AKA the Three Wise Men. But um, uh, any uh, 
discussion on the consent items or I'll entertain an approval uh, or an, a uh, motion for approval. I make a motion we accept them. I'll second. It's been first and seconded that um, we approve the consent agenda as presented. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Here are none. We motion passes. Uh, regular agenda number eight: uh, Southport project update. Welcome, Ken. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Ramos and members of the board. I am here to prevent you, uh, present you an update on the Southport levy improvement project. Uh, where we've been, where we're at, and where we're hoping to be over the next few months, uh, especially as we approach flood season and getting prepared for that. Um, so I'll start off with uh, where we've been over the last uh, month or so, uh, continuing with clearing and grubbing, disking and stripping, uh, primarily in the south area, so from where we tie in uh, in segment B2 uh, and all the way to Davis Road. Um, just recently, we started doing some additional stripping activities uh, north of Linden Road. That's uh, in segment F, and that's in preparation of doing setback levy embankment work um, probably sometime towards the beginning of next month uh, and, uh, and prepping that area for some, uh, some wall to follow soon after that. Um, we have also been doing some demolition work. Uh, structures uh, are, uh, have been re uh, relocated, not relocated, but um, demolished. And uh, at this time, all we're doing is doing some salvaging, so some stuff uh, for RD900 and the old pump station, um, and continuing to do some cleanup work that's associated with that, broken up chunks of concrete, uh, some, ch uh, some clearing and grubbing piles here and there. Um, we'll wind up bringing in a, um, a tub grinder for a lot of that stuff, and that'll be recycled, taken to the cogen plant in Woodland uh, to comply with some of our environmental documents uh, requiring recycling. We are also doing some additional work in the Borrow One uh, area, uh, Borrow Operations. That'll be coming to a close here in October. Um, right now, we're taking about 13 trucks, uh, single, uh, single bottom dumps, and taking that to uh, one of our Borrow areas, and that's where we're doing the blending for the clay material. Um, once we go ahead and uh, finish that up in October, we'll go ahead and restore that site and we'll also uh, finish construction of the Y ramp, which will be the permanent access point um, for, when that, uh, for when that parcel uh, goes back to ag production. Um, we've got some various culvert installations, some of them in Barrow 1, some of them throughout the project area along Village Parkway for access for the Reclamation District, but also um, once we do final restoration in the Barrow area. And then uh, utility relocation, mostly being done by AT&T at this point. Uh, we're at a, at a point where we're doing the last bit of um, major relocation in the south part of the uh, project area where the South River Road alignment uh, will wind up being uh, realigned. And then we have a, uh, some minor um, pg and, and at and relocation that's going to be done uh, in the vicinity of Linden Road where the new cell tower is. Uh, right now, that's all overhead feeds that ultimately go underground. And that work will take place towards the end of this year, beginning of next year, depending on when PG&E and the design can be completed for that. Uh, some of the upcoming work we have um, and that we've been doing is the uh, slurry wall uh, construction that started behind the Bees Lake area has continued to move south. We're at about station 170, which puts us just north of Davis. This is the deep section um, of the wall. We've got about 120 to 150 foot we've been doing per day. Um, and in anticipation of uh, doing, getting more into production on the slurry wall, we've uh, requested extended hours uh, through the city. Uh, that would start next Monday and go to about November 18th. Uh, they feel that's the uh, time frame they need to complete the slurry wall from its current location down to the south tie-in point um, where B1 and B2 interact, and then starting in the north section of F and working their way towards where they started in B's Lake. Um, they're looking to start work at 6 a.m., have it go to 10 p.m., uh, two shifts uh, for that wall work, um, and we'll see how that progresses. Uh, they got notifications sent out to some of the surrounding residents, um, and like I said, we're coordinating with the city to make sure noise, light abatement, all those issues uh, are being addressed. Uh, continuing to borrow, uh, borrow site preparation and harvesting. Right now, we're in site A1, which is our southernmost uh, borrow area. Um, that is located just south of the Oak Hall Bend area. And we'll continue to be in that particular area um, as we can finish uh, levy embankment construction all the way to our tie-in point at B1 and B2. Once we move to the north and section F, we'll be using the borrow site closer to Davis Road. Um, that's considered uh, called borrow site A4. And uh, we'll get the levy embankment done so that we can do wall work um, later on next month. Uh, we've got, like I said, demolition's been completed, offset area explorations, just prepping for next year, uh, going into the offset areas, figuring out what our soil types are, 
so we can uh, know what we're going to grab where and where we're going to place it uh, going next year. Uh, continued uh, culvert installations, roadway construction. I mentioned before South River Road alignment at the very south end of the city. That will be completed this year as well as an access road to one of the residents. Um, once that access road is uh, constructed, everybody that's out there, with the exception of the marinas, will be served off Village Parkway or the adjacent streets. Uh, so all the residents will have access um, off of uh, other, other areas besides South River Road. And once we go ahead and later on next year construct the, uh, the entrances to Sherwood Harbor and Yacht Club, um, we'll have everybody served in that area off either Village Parkway or, like I said, the associated roadways. That's slated to happen April, May of next year. Uh, we'll see how they progress with embankment later on this year and depending on the weather, how, far we can, how early we can get started next year. Um, continue to do biological surveys, cultural coordination. Um, right now, since we're out of the nesting season, our biologists are out there just keeping an eye on GGS, uh, some of the, uh, the raptors and, uh, and birds in the area, but coordinating with our folks. Uh, we are doing some waterside tree removal at this time. Um, so once that's completed, we'll be coordinating with the Reclamation District and making sure all the, uh, the existing levee features are um, being restored back to where they are prior to uh, flood season, as well as making sure we do any type of um, uh, erosion control and uh, stabilization of those banks before the flood season comes. So right now they're uh, looking to start that cleanup work uh, next week and making sure that we get everything out of the way so the uh, Reclamation District can do their job uh, come next flood season. That's what I've got to talk about. I've got some pictures I can go ahead and show you here. The setback levee embankment fill. Right now, uh, we are just south of the Oak Hall Bend area. We've got the platform elevation constructed from just north of Oak Hall Bend all the way to back behind Bees Lake. Um, so the working platform is uh, the elevation where we can start slurry wall construction. Um, we're continuing to work from the, uh, the old or Walnut Orchard, what we call Station 100. Uh, down to the Oak Hall Bend area. That's looking to be done uh, end of next week. And uh, we'll continue to progress south when we can get into our tie-in point. Um, here we can kind of see an image of the uh, type two material, which is we're using in our clay core. That's that upper left picture, a little darker soil, uh, real sticky and uh, fun to work with, but uh, they're managing to, to progress there. And then in the uh, picture on the bottom, uh, the Oak Hall Bend area, where they've got some of the subgrade and first lift in, and then another stockpile of the type two clay material. They've got those stockpiles spread throughout the project, um, so they can go ahead and place that as they continue going to the south. The uh, slurry wall installation, right now we're in the deep section. So like I said, in the uh, Bees Lake area and continuing south, everybody sees the big long stick excavator out there doing the, uh, the digging. That's going down about 67 to uh, 72 foot. Um, and keying into the material down below. And back behind that process is the actual mixing operation. This is where the slurry that gets dug out is uh, mixed and then placed at the, uh, the lead-in trench, what they call, um, at the back end of the wall. And the slurry is pushed in there. And uh, from there, it'll go ahead and uh, sit and allow for a settlement time. And uh, we'll just continue to move our way south. Uh, this is the Barrow 1 operation. Uh, on your top left-hand side, that's the, uh, the drainage pond area, and they're uh, confining their operations to just that little rectangular area. That's uh, on the farther east corner of the property. Uh, like I said, they've got 13 uh, single-bottom trucks that they're uh, delivering everything to in the project, and that's been going wrong really well. Uh, we had some saturated soil conditions before, but once, the, uh, once we went through a little bit of summer, it all dried up, and we're really staying in the top four foot of that material. So it's been working really well uh, for transport and whatnot. And in the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see the uh, Y ramp, the permanent Y ramp that's being constructed. So we went ahead and installed the culvert along the drainage ditch in coordination with RD 999. Um, and that's been backfilled, and that's actually at a stage where we can start putting AB and then ultimately paving towards the end of October. And uh, here's what it looks like uh, from the aerial photos that uh, Sky High Perspectives has taken. Uh, we're in the vicinity of Bees Lake with the top photo. Uh, you can see the slurry trench moving its way along. Uh, that was done towards the tail end of last month, so we made quite a bit of progress since then. We've got about 2,500 foot of wall currently constructed. Um, like I said, 120 to 150 foot a day. Uh, once we get out of the deep section, we'll be going into a shallower uh, wall excavation, closer to 27 foot deep. And uh, with the extended shifts, we're hoping to get between four and 500 foot of wall constructed a day. So that'll be able to go pretty quick. Um, and then there on the uh, bottom of the uh, slide, we've got the borrow A1. That's the um, borrow area we're currently constructing, uh, excuse me, borrowing from to construct the south part of the uh, setback levee embankment. 
uh, and that's been going pretty well. Some of the soils have been a little more saturated, uh, wet, than, um, than we anticipated as far as uh, treating into drier stuff further to the north, but um, hasn't slowed us down much. And that's what I've got. Um, currently, the contractor is behind schedule. Uh, they've got a lot of work to do uh, the rest of this year and next. Um, we're hoping that once we see how far we can get based on uh, rains, weather, soil conditions uh, into the, by the end of this year, hopefully working into November, December, we'll sit down, look at production rates, uh, look at the schedule, and update things accordingly. Uh, the goal is to still have everything constructed by the end of 2018, but we'll have a better idea of what our ultimate schedule will look like uh, end of this year, once we get into the rain seasons and we're able to actually analyze the data, see what their production rates are, see what their plan is for next year, whether they go ahead and bring additional resources in or whether they think what they've got is fine. Um, but like I said, we've got a, CM, a really good CM team. Um, our folks have been uh, in coordination with all the different stakeholders out there and uh, all of our goals is to have this thing done by 2018. Any questions? Go ahead. Thanks. Go ahead. Thanks for the, the update. <clears throat> it's it's great to go by and, and watch some of it, kind of, although not as closely as you are every day. Are you are you pretty happy with the efficiency of like how they're going through the project? They've gotten better. There's definitely some room for improvement on their ends, whether it's more equipment, whether it's additional operators. But there's been uh, you know as far as getting getting additional folks out there, they are getting some people out of the hall. But it is AECOM. They have quite a bit of resources. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that uh, that they've got they've got room for improvement. Um, their subcontractors have actually been doing a really good job. Inquip is doing this slurry wall mm -hmm. uh, has been doing a great job. Like I said. 120 to 150 foot a day. Um, that's exactly what we anticipated, if not a little bit more. And once we go to these extended hours, I, I think we'll be uh, doing a really good job on that. Atlas, who's been doing the tree removal, uh, been good, really good to work with, uh, very efficient, very quick on what they do. Uh, so I think, I think for the most part, we've had a pretty good, uh, pretty good rapport with everybody out there. But like I said, AECOM does have some room for improvement. Okay, thanks. And then the, um the road, so right now the access from the south is just for the project on um, uh, Gregory? Uh, yeah. For, yeah. And then and then now it's it's instead of coming down London, London now it's closed and you're coming down locks if you're going to the marina. Correct. And so until that you, you mentioned the little road, so yeah, so we just actually closed down Linden Road uh, yesterday. Okay. Uh, earlier, in the, earlier in the week, actually last Saturday, is when they opened up South River Road at the north end at Locks. So all traffic, and we've been coordinating with the city via newsletters as well as the public work departments and the emergency respond folks. Um, everything's coming down there for the time being and probably until we get those new uh, ramps constructed off Village Parkway. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're going to go ahead and make sure we maintain the entrance uh, over there and make sure everything's safe down along those shoulders as well. We've done some tree clearing in those areas, so there's definitely some cleanup work that needs to be done over there. But uh, we'll go ahead and make sure that that's in that, whatever condition we can help keep it in. Uh, ultimately, it is Public Works' responsibility to maintain the road, so we're coordinating with them, okay. um, especially as you know that road's not in the greatest of shape. And with the rains and, and the traffic that's going on there, it's continuing to kind of fall apart. So we'll continue to coordinate with them, whether it be a potholing, like I said, clean up the shoulders where we can. But um, like I said, uh, it should be traversable at least uh, until we get the, um, the new uh, entrances constructed up there. We'll have, we have temporary cul-de-sacs currently built at Davis and um, Linden. And uh, we have the entrance at Gregory Road really primarily for use on the, uh, the hauling operations from bar one mm -hmm. Like I said, that'll cease towards the end of October. <clears throat> so around that time, we'll go ahead and build a temporary cul-de-sac at that time. So we have that down there. And um, next year, when we go ahead and actually get towards the end of construction, that's when they'll rebuild those cul-de-sacs to their permanent locations and permanent sizes. And then we'll get the AC surfacing on towards the end of the year. And you're not anticipating any conflict with the project with folks coming down locks onto locks drive onto um, South River Road to get to the marina. There's no conflict with the project. No, we've got, we've got kind of a, we have a hammerhead turnaround set up at Davis Road, so if folks do need to go ahead and go down there and a lot of the looky-loos go ahead okay, and make their yeah. way down there and see the things, but we do have access and we do have turnaround uh, areas for them, but also the, uh, the fire trucks and anybody else that needs okay. to be out there. The police have been patrolling. I run into them every once in a while, so they are getting some type of enforcement out there, but like I said, right now with one way one out, one way in, one way out, it's, uh, unless you're down there for the marinas or for recreation, there's really not much to see okay. once you go south of there. Thanks. Bill? If you can go back to your first uh, drawing that was on there, please. Mind going back for me? Is that the one with all the descriptions? 
of what's going on or yeah, the pictures? The first, so. uh, your very first one you had uh, there. Whoops, we just passed it. Right there. Okay. Um, just for curiosity's sake, you show um, red bars um, in different locations. Mm -hmm. uh, what do those represent? Those represent the breach areas for the offset area. So those will be the areas that once we go ahead and get the offset area graded, the new levee embankment um, constructed along the setback levee alignment, we'll go ahead and degrade the existing uh, levee in those areas, and that'll open it up to the Sacramento River flows. So that's where a lot of, that's the north offset area has the one at the very north end that feeds into, and essentially it'll go up and down with the, with, uh, with the river, but it only have the one entrance and exit. The one on the south end, uh, like the one just south of Oak Hall Bend, that'll be opened up, and then in our interaction at B1, B2. So that's where the South River Road kind of dives down and then goes to uh, Gregory Avenue. Yeah. That's kind of right in that vicinity. So that'll be, that'll be degraded to about elevation 710. Uh, right now, top of levee is about 40. Uh, so just to give you an idea of what, how, how far it's going to go down, essentially uh, 30 to, uh, to 33 feet. And uh, most, of, most existing levee will remain in its uh, current location, although there are areas that we're going to degrade that anywhere from 2.5 to 10 foot. But those will be the, the biggest areas where you'll see the existing levee kind of come down like this and then open up for the river. Thank you. That's it. No that, that was going to be my question. What the, the balance of that existing levy, how much it was going to be degraded, but what you're saying is it's going to vary depending on location, huh? Yeah, so we've got the, the, uh, the breachings, the breaches that you see represented right. by the red diagrams. And like I said, that'll come down about 30, 33 foot in the, uh, from the existing elevations. Once we come off, off, those, off those areas, it'll be about degraded about 10 foot or so for a certain stretch, and then the remainder will be degraded about two and a half foot. Um, it, it was all designed based on the hydrology and the hydraulics of it, yeah. uh, but those elevations, um, that's, that's typically the elevations you'll see. The, um, the extended hours you mentioned, what, what, are, what will those hours, what are they requesting or what will be? So they've requested from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., so we'll have two shifts, um, and it's slurry wall work only, right. so they'll go ahead and the contractor will continue to work their 7 to 5.30 shift, but the slurry wall contractor will get in there about an hour early to start their operation, and then sometime in the early afternoon they'll switch crews, and they'll continue to go ahead and, and do that slurry wall work until 10 p.m. And, so and that's just the long stick excavator with the dozer and the uh, excavator in the back doing the mixing. So it's about seven guys out there. They're also going to be doing taking samples, doing soundings, which tell you what the slope of the wall is looking like uh, in that trench, and just doing the documentation and quality control. Okay. And it sounds like as long as the, the dirt production keeps up with producing exactly. the platform, then, uh, you know, that helps. And the accelerated... Uh, uh, work on the trench, you know, they'll help help them catch up some. So, yeah, but, yeah. And, and you know, I, I, we 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 do realize, like I said, the levy embankment fill is going into production of about five to six thousand cubic yards a day. So they've gotten better, but uh, depending on how fast they can dig that slurry wall, they could catch up. To catch them. up, yeah. So well, when they get shallower, it's going to go, like you said, faster. Yeah, and we've talked to them multiple occasions, and they say they're ready for it, and they'll they'll be able to meet the production goals. So we'll see. Okay. And the last thing I'm curious about, uh, you mentioned the. Uh, realignment work of South River Road down there, I guess, in section section A. Um, is that is that just a small realignment or? Yeah, so that'll happen where the uh, the concrete abutments for the old rail line that'll be the northern ends of it, and just to the south, about 600 foot is where we'll tie into existing South River Road over there. The grades will stay relatively the same out there. Um, the road alignment will be straightened out some, but unfortunately, won't be able to take out the big kink at the abutments. The only way to do that would be to totally... Will, will the abutments it. remain? Yeah. Good. They're, they're iconic. If you went to James Marshall High School, you know, you know about those you know. abutments. So. <laughs> so, okay. Well, yeah. if there's anything else, Ken, thank you very much. No problem. Very, very comprehensive. Thanks for your Appreciate time. it. Uh, on to uh, our regular monthly uh, Wasafka project updates. Good morning, Chair Ramos and members of the board. Um, um, Ken did a very good job of talking about all of what's going on for the project, so uh, that takes care of half of my report. Uh, not quite. Well, only half. I have a question. <laughs> you have, you want ahead. me to answer the question now, or do you want to wait till the end? Pardon? Do you want to ask your question now, or do you want to wait till the end? Uh, no, it, it pertains to um, uh, the project update. Uh, why don't you go ahead and, and ask your question? Well, it, but I think you're the one that has to answer it. The, the Southport project update or, or, or his report in the general? The Southport project. Oh, okay. Then go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. 
if the with, with the damages being done in uh, Texas and Florida and up the East Coast, and Army Corps of Engineers is fully going full bore with that operation, uh, how's that going to affect our funding from the Corps? If you have heard anything, uh, you know, or you may not know or what, but uh, I think it's something that. Uh, yeah, I, I have not heard uh, of any effects to the normal um, budgeting process for the Corps or the normal federal budgeting process. There's certainly, um, they've, you know, the president passed, uh, I guess, an omnibus budget, or the Congress did recently, to, that secured some funding for um, disaster relief. Um, but there's, they're still entertaining the normal federal budget cycle and the normal federal budget process that feeds the Army Corps of Engineers, and I haven't heard of any cuts being proposed um, because of the, the disasters. Okay. If you, be, if you hear anything, be sure and let us know. Oh, yeah, we will. <laughs> okay, go, go ahead, Greg. <laughs> All right, so I, I think primarily I just want to focus on the federal project update and, and our efforts in, in helping to move our project forward and obtain uh, funding for the rest of the federal project. <clears throat> So staff has been working with the Corps. We've met twice now um, to discuss with them uh, ways of improving our benefit cost ratio and our ability to compete for uh, federal dollars. The first hurdle that we're trying to um, get through is the pre-construction engineering and design money, or PED money with the Corps. Um, so I think as you recall, our benefit cost ratio currently sits at about 1.2. Um, and we're working with the Corps to reduce costs in order to improve that BCR. So one of the things that we're working on is providing actual costs for Southport. I think the um, Corps' estimate in the federal project for Southport's on the order of about $370 million for that project. Um, from our perspective, known costs, both sunk and under contract, that project uh, comes in under 180, so it's about half of what the federal estimate was. Um, so um, we've articulated that information. We've handed it off to the core. Um, they they can't say they they don't automatically accept it. They have to go through their own uh, review and verification. Um, but the, from what they what we've presented and what they've seen, um, the costs look reasonable. The assumptions that we've made on for contingency uh, seem reasonable. Um, so it's pretty close. We feel it's pretty close to an apples to apples uh, comparison with what they'll do with it. Our estimate for how that can improve the BCR is about a quarter of a point. So we can go from 1.2 to about 1.45. It's not a huge jump, but it's still moving in the right direction. Um, the other, uh, one of the other things that we're working with the core on is um, reducing the project schedule. Uh, the original schedule for uh, construction of our federal project that was contained in the GRR was 17 years. That long uh, schedule introduces additional costs for escalation during construction. It also introduces large costs that the core considers in their BCR calculation for, they call it interest during construction, but it's really an opportunity cost. If we were not investing in your project, we could invest it over here and earn interest on it. And so the longer that project is, the more those opportunity costs add up, and the more they fact, you know, the higher the cost that factors into that benefit cost ratio calculation. So we've proposed to reduce that schedule from 17 years to 11, and that uh, includes the Southport project, which we are constructing in advance of the core actually going to construction. So there is some discussion about removing Southport from the schedule altogether or in some way or another shortening the schedule based on our implementation of Southport. So it could reduce the schedule from 11 perhaps down to nine years. Uh, we didn't want to be too aggressive with the core. We had this discussion with them. They think there may be some more room to shorten that schedule, but we're going to let them carry that ball and we'll continue to, to nudge them to go that direction. Um, and the effect that we see from 17 years to 11 years, we see about a third of a point increase on the BCR, so about 0.33. So that brings it up to, I guess that's about 1.8. 1.78. 1.78. 1.78. 1.78. 1.78. 1.78. 1.78. 1.78. 1.78. 1.78. 1.78. 1.78. 1.78. 1.78. 1.78. 1
I'm, there you I'm go. keeping track. Just keeping track. <laughs> uh, so that's where we that's where we see that going. The cord um, again, they can't really comment on that. They have to go through their calculations and um, and then see where this lands. Both the cost update and the schedule update require independent review by other districts, and then ultimately has to be reviewed and approved by the San Francisco Division. Uh, CORE can't officially start working on this until the first quarter of fiscal year 18, so come October 1, they're going to start crunching their numbers. Uh, there is some concern um, by the CORE that uh, there isn't funding available for them to, to do this work. We have not passed the PED hurdle. They do not have a budget to go to the next phase. Um, they're looking at internally shifting some money. I think they can shift money between projects up to about $50,000. They've taken it upon themselves to start that process and looking where they can do that. But it, um, in order for us to continue to work with them, uh, it may be advantageous for us to um, provide some money to the core to keep them working. Uh, so that's something I like to ask the board to consider. Um, but their goal and our goal is for them come October 1 for them to start crunching the numbers. They think they can do their work inside of about a month. And then they'll have to shop these things out for anywhere from six to eight week review and concurrence time frames. Um, and this also, go, also goes into the Thanksgiving and, and Christmas holiday season. So it it's, adds time onto these reviews typically. Um, so we're hoping that when all is said and done, we're going to be uh, with an officially approved or modified BCR from, from the core around the January, February time frame. Um, the other thing I mentioned about Southport and whether it can be removed or not from the schedule, obviously we want to get credit for the Southport project um, that we apply to the federal project. So it, it can't just be removed. Um, but depending on where it shows up in the schedule, it can significantly in, impact or affect that whole opportunity cost calculation. Southport's one of the most expensive elements of the federal project. It's almost one third of the federal dollars. That project is scheduled uh, in the front years of the project. It has the longest lead time for that opportunity cost. So it has the biggest impact, negative impact on the benefit cost ratio. If we can shift that project and or its credit to later on in the schedule, then on paper, just by moving it in the schedule, we get another quarter percent increase or quarter point increase on the BCR just from moving it. So. Um, this raised a lot of eyebrows with the core um, for and got them thinking about how this might be logistically scheduled so that it doesn't have a, the negative impact. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense that the locals are carrying the ball forward, advancing it with local funds in advance of the core, but because we're doing it early, we get penalized the most through the BCR. So they get it, we get it, um, but they still have to follow their guidelines, and so we're we have yet to see where this is going to land, but they're actively working on that and looking at the guidelines to see what flexibility they have. And then the, what they're going to do on their own as well is uh, recalculate those uh, escalation costs for construction, which will bring the overall project cost down, which will bring the opportunity costs down and will have a positive impact again on the BCR. We're unsure what that will be, but we're going to continue to work with them and, and get feedback periodically as they start working on this on what those impacts are. Um, our, I would get, I would say our optimistic um, estimate on where the BCR will land um, from just this work that I've described is somewhere just north of two. 2.1, maybe as much as 2.2, but I think that's all we're going to get out of this. Um, I think that's about as far as we're going to push the BCR with, with these efforts. Unless we start looking at ways that we can improve the benefit side, which we are looking into, that's the numerator of the calculation. If yeah. we, can, we can describe or articulate additional benefits, um, then we'll bring those to bear and introduce those and see if we can further improve the BCR. I, I was going to ask that question. I mean, that, that, that numerator, I mean, do they have a fixed benefit that they continue with? Because over time, you know, the amount of potential damage increases in, in you know, same rate as, you know, all these other construction costs and everything else. So it, it, if you put that into the mix, you know, how does that affect things? Yeah, and not only 
do costs go up over time or the, the avoidable damages um, escalate? Um, but there's the core headquarters has issued guidance um, nationwide that um, districts look at quantifying and being um, more expansive in their review of benefits. They just don't have any guidance on how to do that. Our, our uh, peers across the river um, are currently in the process of trying to improve their BCR as well, and they've hired a, a consultant and are proposing additional benefits be con to be considered for their project. And so we're keenly watching and observing that process. It's a little bit of a struggle for the Corps because, again, they don't, they don't have any guidance for this, so this is requiring multiple levels of review within um, the Corps' organization, division, and headquarters. Um, but we're hoping that they'll pave, help pave the way um, so that we can come in behind Good. and take advantage of that process and do something similar. Then other ways that we can continue to improve the BCR is to continue to advance that federal project. If we're able to partner with the state, and I think this has been brought up before in some of the advanced planning presentations that we've presented for the board, but um, if the state is willing to partner with us, uh, then while we're implementing Southport, we can look at designing additional increments, working with the Corps on what, what they would undertake next. And if we can uh, start advancing those designs, then when we do get a design funding agreement or when we do get the new start construction, well, first, as we're advancing those designs, we're able to articulate a more finite cost. They typically come down. So we'll be able to give refined cost to the Corps as we advance that effort. Um, we'll work with the Corps so that um, they're involved in the design process. So when we get to the point where they have funding, we're in a design funding agreement, we can hand over designs to them to, to carry the ball forward, and we haven't lost too much time. Um, so part of our next steps, that now that the Corps is working on uh, doing their own calculations on cost and schedule and BCR update, we're now shifting gears and working with the state and consulting with the state on, all right, guys, we're not going to get to 2.5. What can, we, what can we do together to um, keep advancing the schedule, keep doing no regrets work that can either be credited or cross-shared with the core, um, that can further refine costs through design and other efforts, um, that continues to push that BCR towards 2.5. Um, and so our first meeting with the state for that effort is next week, and uh, I'll, I will update the board as, as that progresses. I think, uh, ideally, um, we, we, we still need to true up. Normal, the normal true up process through the feasibility study, the GRR piece that we did with the Corps, occurs in PED. The first task is close out feasibility, true up costs. Uh, the Corps, uh, in its haste to get us to the uh, finish line on the GRR, um, I'm aware, I don't know that they're aware, that we still owe somewhere on the fifty to sixty thousand dollars in cash for our share of the project we don't have enough in-kind service to um to fully uh meet our was our, it a 50 50. it's 50 50 with the core and the non-federal and then it's another 50 50 non-federal between, between us and, and the yeah. state the state's done it all in in cash we've had a combination of cash and in-kind our in-kind is limited. It's not enough to fully meet our cost share obligation, so we do owe some cash. Um, so now may be the time to go through that true-up process and provide them with the cash that we need to pay, um, but that may refill their coffers enough to help them start work, continue working on our project. So, but um, that may, that also may just balance the scales and they go, all right, now we're even. <laughs> we still have no funds to work on your project. So um, I, I think uh, staff would recommend that we bring an item back to the board next month to uh, perhaps give the general manager authorization to enter into an agreement with the Corps to provide funds, should that be necessary to keep the Corps working on this effort. So um, okay. we'll look at doing that next month. 
And then uh, lastly, I just wanted to mention that October 21st kicks off the 2017 California Flood Preparedness Week. Um, I've been working with city um, public information officer who's been reaching out to the uh, Washington Unified School District and tentatively selected a site and date for a city uh, with SAFCA Washington Unified event like we've done in previous years. Um, right now we're looking at uh, Monday the 21st, Stonegate Elementary. I'll continue to provide information to the board as, as that effort and that coordination continues. But uh, tentatively mark your calendars now for Monday, October 21st, sometime in the morning um, for a plan pack protect extravaganza at Stonegate Elementary. <laughs> And I think that's really all I wanted to cover, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board has. Do you have any questions? Okay. Um, I think that's um, it's prudent to uh, you know, bring forward that to us the possibility of assisting the core to keep things going. So you know, I think we, I think that'd be great to bring it bring it before us next month to take a look at. Um, the other thing I wanted to, in your report here, you mentioned, um, you know, the um, mayor and city manager uh, going to um, D.C. on 26th and 28th. That's obviously that component of, uh, you know, representation there in, in D.C. And, and working with folks uh, is important, too, to, to push forward the possibility of PED monies and, you know, ob eventually the, the new start. And... Um, I would like, if possible, that uh, once they return, that we could get a report, either written or verbally, as to you know how the meeting went. So, I mean, I'm, I myself am personally interested in, in you know how things are progressing back there, and I think uh, the board members would as well. So, if you could pass that on. Yeah, we'll do. So, um, Bill left, so he'll. Well, he comes back, but is there uh, any other any other items? If not, we're adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>